Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, this movie is so great. I love it so much. Uh, where to start? Maybe we could start talking a little bit about the structure of the film. Um, the structure is so unique, sort of the the faux documentary style and the uh, um, you know fact and fiction, all of that sort of ends up on the screen in such a beautiful way. Um, was that something that was always part of the the film when when you guys got together and? Yeah, it was it was definitely part of the script. I felt that the story itself was really funny and uh -huh. really tragic and really crazy <laughs> and true-ish. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted, I did, wanted the script to be all those things. Mm -hmm. So it was a conscious choice. I also felt like all the characters were sort of rebellious and wrong-headed, and I wanted the script to sort of mirror that, so I wanted to include the, you know, talking to the camera, although you actually took it farther, and just the stuff that everybody always says you can't do in a screenplay. like you know, split screen. And at one point, Allison Janney's character criticizes the screenplay, you know. Once you, <laughs> but it works, I think, because it mirrors the, the characters. It was really fascinating, you know, when we got Steven's script, which I absolutely loved, to actually have a story where the audience has to make a choice of what they believe. Like, right. we're not telling everybody. It's almost like watching a documentary where you get to see everybody's perspective and then make that choice. But as we were editing, we started to actually make it more ambiguous whose version we were hearing, so it gets a little more convoluted in the back half of the movie, which I feel you just get engrossed in the story and start to forget whose version we're hearing. It adds to like the energy and the sort of urgency of the piece, where you're just like, because everyone knows what happened, sort of, right? But Sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> But we're still sort of. <laughs> but it's all about yeah, it's all about um, who's talking and and it's all about the narration, right? It's all about the the unreliability of whose story you're hearing. Um, I think that's incredibly smart. Is that something that um, when when you first read the script that you were worried about or that you wanted to sort of? It sounded like you almost leaned more into it then. Yeah, when I when I read it, there's 265 scenes in 110 pages. <laughs> Which is a, I don't know if you, but it's a lot of scenes for, ah, a, for a film. <laughs> Typically, there might be like oh. maybe 130 or something. So having that many short scenes, I was trying to actually even find a reference for it in, in film. It's like obviously like one of, the, one of the things I found was maybe the first half of Goodfellas has a lot of scenes right, right, right. and a lot of voiceover. But, um, you know, I went back to, to, to Die For, which has that that structure, but it, it's not dealing with multiple versions of the same story. The Nicole Kidman detective? Yeah, the, yeah, it was right. from the, the Gus Van Sant film, and, oh, and, and, they, and they talk to camera. But uh, I couldn't find anything other than that, really, that had this structure, so I was a little nervous about it. I wasn't nervous at all. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I wrote it. <laughs> okay, so you wrote it, so you knew what was going on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right, well, let's talk a little bit Sebastian's about... Sebastian's down there, too. Yeah, I feel like Sebastian <laughs> hasn't had a line well, of dialogue I, I, in <laughs> ten pages. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just happy to be here. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> well, yes. Sebastian didn't know he was going to be here till 15 minutes ago, so... No, but, uh, you know, now I'm, I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the casting. Um, I mean, this cast is unbelievable, you know? Yeah. Yeah, right? Alison Janney, of course, um, and your lead, and of course, you, Mr. Stanley, are fantastic in this movie. Like, so, um, can you guys tell us a little bit about what the casting process was like? And Mr. Stanley, can you tell me a little bit about like maybe what drew you to want to be involved in this project, and 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 what you liked about this character? Well, I mean, it, it just it was just as I had actually seen the Price of Gold, thirty for thirty, not too long before. Craig and I first had a meeting and then um, so it was just really fresh in my mind and then when I got the script uh, I was really excited about it but I but I kind of found myself discovering the story all over again in, in, in a very different way than I you know than I got from watching the documentary and 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 it was just it was just one of those things that I couldn't stop thinking about and that's always been my number one sort of sign, you know, a good sign for me to want to pursue something. It's just you end up quoting lines from it, which I did, and then there were things about it that were funny, there were things about it that were 
tragic and scary and definitely scary in terms of, you know, for me to even think whether or not I, you know, I would ever be able to play anything like that. And, and so all, all that kind of generated interest um, from the get-go. Uh, and then you, as you discover, sort of as you kind of go into it more and more, it was more the challenge of really finding your way in. And, you know, like I've said before, it, it was in some strange way for me, it made sense in my head if it was a little bit of a crazy love story in the, at the end of the day. And I, and I had to look at it that way. It was, it was, you know, it was the only way that I could kind of come into it without judgment and just do my job, which is, you know, to serve the script, which was unbelievable. Like a demented love story, really. Um, yeah, but, you know, I mean, look at any of Robert De Niro's filmography. <laughs> You're like... <laughs> You know, it's like, I actually was one of the things I was watching a lot. I think you, maybe Craig and I talked about it a little bit was some of the scenes in Raging Bull. I, I don't know, like, because tone was very specific. And, and that was always a big thing that I wanted to make sure I got right with him. It was just, it was a very tricky dance because you're obviously we're dealing with a very heinous thing with right. domestic violence. And then we're trying to do a left turn into comedy like immediately after that. And how to keep as empathetic with his character, but still re respect the violence that was going on. So that just, and Sebastian just mastered that in a way that was coming from a very, it was coming from a very real place and it didn't condone it, but you understood the cycle more of like, like what their relationship was. And I think also the pacing in the film is, it, it, it expresses that so well because the violence is not, it's not like glorified or romanticized or, like even exaggerated, it's just sort of out of nowhere and shocking and brutal. Um, so, um, so Mr. State, so what, did you have like sort of conversations with your um, fantastic co-star when you guys were doing this sort of more violent? Scene? No, I did. I mean, I think in our chemi chemistry test, which yeah. I had with her, you know, I uh, right away I kind of felt like it was, you know, going to be very safe in a way. Like, I mean, like. Yeah. She and I were sort of laughing, and there were things that, you know, I was, I mean, she's an incredibly generous actress, first of all, to begin with. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. We, it was, the whole thing was very comfortable, <laughs> given the subject matter, you know. They were both, I mean, Margot, as you can see in the film, she goes from 15 to 46 in this. <laughs> yeah. And just a, you know, just an enormous range that she had to do, but they were so prepared. They both, like, everybody came in, had the scene in mind where we wanted to go to, but then they were so reactive to each other that there's a lot of spontaneity, which was part of how we shot it. So a lot of it's handheld, no mocks. They could go wherever they wanted. So it was never really the same take for the two of them. And they really could, all of them really, it's the luxury of having such great actors. Yeah. They just they can all bounce off each other and get take anything that's thrown at them. I was going to go back to the casting question. Um, I wrote the part for Allison, Jenny. Really? Yeah, because we've been friends since God was a small child. <laughs> uh, we knew each other back at the neighborhood playhouse uh, when we were in acting school. And I'd written parts for her before, but she'd never gotten to play them for one reason or another. And so on this one, I was so determined that it was a spec script, which meant that it went out and uh, no one paid me to write it, but it, there was a lot of heat on it, so I could say, Allison Janney is playing the part that I wrote for her, and I want it in writing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and I got it, and it was it was lucky. And then Margot pretty much chased it. You know, she Wonderful. she read it, and then she she sought it out. Was there a point you were nervous, maybe like that um, Allison's schedule wasn't going to work out or anything like oh that? Oh my God! Yeah, it was yeah. it was crazy because she's on Mom TV show. Oh, right. She was also going to open in a play on Broadway. And so they were booked to, to do that. And so we had a very finite amount of time. I think she I did think 10 eight days. days. Yeah. yeah, something like that. What? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's unreal. That's unreal. Um, uh, you guys like Alice and Janney's performance in the film a little bit? <laughs> I thought it was unbelievable. She's unbelievable. She's so... She's like a force of nature in this film. Like she's just like this. Even when she's not on screen, she's just haunting the the every 
every inch of the frame, I feel like. No, she's so good. And I knew that she was so good because I've seen her forever. And she was, by the way, she was that good at the Neighborhood Playhouse, you know, uh, <laughs> back then. Um, but I, I, frankly, I was just tired of her getting these sort of shoehorn parts in movies where she's like the CIA director, which doesn't show a whole lot of range, you know. So I wanted to give her, you know, more to do. And then she just elevated it. And so, and so then you said um, that Miss Rombie sort of pursued the script. Like, what, what do you mean by that? She was, she read it and she was she, she, in love she, with it. and She got the script uh, and I had just partnered up with Brian Unkless, who uh, was producer on the movie. And the day after, uh, I said, okay, I'll go with you. Careful of what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> we got a call saying, Margot Robbie read it. Would you meet with her? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we would. <laughs> and then when did uh, Mr. Stan come along? I don't, I mean, it was... It was months. It was honestly a right around this time last okay. year. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and, and the great thing about it, thank God, was that I actually had this much facial hair last year too, <laughs> just in time so I, I could like actually shave a mustache. Otherwise you wouldn't have got it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Now the amazing thing, because I was thrilled to, you know, I, I came on board after Margot and Allison, oh, okay. which I was thrilled to have the two of them. And so then we went through, the, we took our time to try and figure out Jeff Galuli because it was such an important piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. with the tone. And we really had the luxury that, like, um, that we could do chemistry reads with Margot. And Sebastian came in and did this performance and he left the room and Margot and I were like, he's the guy. It's like, <laughs> that's him right there. And it was amazing, and part of that was that chemistry of like, you know, there's that scene in the, in the police car, or in the car, he gets pulled over by the cops. And in the audition, he goes, don't say a fucking word or I'll kill you. And that's the line, and then he re leans over and he kisses her. In the audition, it wasn't in the script. And it just was so surprising, and such a mix of, you know, emotions going on that he pulled off that, you know, he did a bunch of that stuff all yeah. the time. He did the tone of the script in his audition. And it's like these that. sort of power dynamics between Allison and Margot and and you. You know, it's like, it's yeah. That's that's why I think it's so amazing about the film is that there's just this sort of like these different levels of um, you know domination and submission that are constantly happening and it's flowing back and forth. Um, so did you guys have like um, rehearsal time at all, or was it more just sort of you went right into production? I think we were, we maybe worked for maybe. like half a day, was it? What? <laughs> no. Oh, a day. No, we had like, I think like a, like three, yeah, we, four we days week, of rehearsal. Or something but like, like I had a, like a day with like you and your yeah. scenes and then a day with Allison and Margo yeah. and. That's insane. <laughs> All you need is a day. Independent film. You never have a, Jesus you never Christ. have a lot of luxury. Um, I mean, I just, um, part of this whole, you know, and, the, and then the schedule was crazy, but. You know, and Steven's script was amazing, but still these guys all got to bring stuff to it. And Mago as well, like one of my, two of my favorite moments in the movie with Mago, one is um, the scene in the courtroom. And we're running around and she's producing as well. So oh, she's so yeah, like, oh, we're trying to figure out our schedule for the next day and this and that. Oh, we've got to shoot right now. And she's like, okay, what, ready, ready? And she'll step in and she just starts doing this scene. And I, I think there's maybe three or four lines of dialogue and she's just doing such a great performance that I just don't cut. And that she just keeps it going, like with that take, uh, which I, I just was, it gave me chills on the day. And then another shot we did, again, with all the spontaneity going on, and she's in the, um, getting ready for the Lilyhammer, and she's sitting in front of the mirror. And uh, um, my DP comes over to me, Nicholas, and, he's, and she's doing this makeup scene. He goes, hey, maybe for the last take, why don't you see if she can try and get her game face on, just like put, the, put on her makeup and smile, try and smile through it. And I went over to her and I, and I just sort of threw that at her at the last second because it was a crazy busy day. I said, could you try that? And she's like, yeah, okay. And she did one take and we moved on. <laughs> it's just, it was it. But, yeah. but even like to piggyback on that real quick, one of the, you know, the genius of him, like honestly, one of my favorite memories is in the, in the courtroom when we all get arrested and we're just sitting there and the camera pans around and it kind of cuts to me and I, I turn to it and I like break the fourth wall. Like I remember that day because 
that was like uh, originally I think it was like four shots or four five setup shots. five sh five setups that was going to be like you know the judge and the verdict and the line I had and setting up the courtroom and I know that he and the DP had to come up like we were like way at least like I don't even know like maybe another hour and a half to shoot like that day and they had to come up with like a way to do it and they just came up with this fucking badass one <laughs> shot track you know like like steady cam that you come in and you sweep through and you and you get it and it's like it's like that kind of clutch Wait, so they thinking. came up with that on the day in the moment. That's Craig. He that's one of those things there. that seems like someone has weeks in advance to play. That's amazing. Well, you come in as prepped as you can, and then, right. you know, we've talked about it all a lot with the DP and all the, and then it's, that's the luxury. If you're, like, prepped, and then you can actually throw it out the window <laughs> if you need to. <laughs> um, so let me back up for just a second, though. Uh, so, Mr. Stan, you were saying earlier that uh, there are a couple lines in the script that were um, so resonant to you that you're kind of just saying to yourself over and over again, or? Well, I mean, it was just a lot of Levana's lines were just, were <laughs> killing me. Like, I mean, it just was like, like I couldn't can stop. You, can you give a, I, don't know. I mean, any of the, yeah, like the, the stuff with the parrot or like, where's my, <laughs> where's my, you know, yeah, yeah where, where's my store line going or, or. <laughs> <laughs> or I love when she's like, eat my ass, Diane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just like crazy. Or or she's a soft... Soft four. Soft four. four. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. Like I mean, just stuff like that. Can I was... tell you, though, my favorite line, <laughs> my favorite line that I wrote for Lavana did not make the movie. What? And it was when it's in the, the, the modern day Lavana. Oh. And she says, Tanya always says, growing up, everybody hit her. Well, maybe that's just a natural reaction to being around her. <laughs> I was like, Jesus oh. Christ. I'm like, Craig, can we put that in? Wait, and you gotta, you gotta tell a story the about, about Paul, uh, Sean, Tony Harding. The, the oh, yeah. Okay, how good is Paul, the Sean, the bodyguard? But, but I remember I was, watching, I was watching the scene, I was watching the, the dailies or something, and he, they say, he just, the line, his, his line is, uh, I don't know a, to a Tony Harding. I don't know a Tony Harding. <laughs> but in, in the script, I, what I wrote was, uh, how do you know Tanya Harding? He's like, I don't know a Tanya Harding. Aren't you her bodyguard? <laughs> well, let me finish. Well, I don't know her well. And that's what, that's what I thought. And then he kept saying, Tony Harding, Tony Harding. <laughs> and I was like, oh. That's one of the best I like, lines. I love it I so know, much. I know, but I was like, actors improvising. And then I went and I looked at the script and there was a misprint. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. yeah and it was so in the script, it's Tony Harding. And I was like, oh, it's me. I think that's in the trailer now, too, right? That's yeah. such a good joke. Yeah. How would I know it's a misprint? <laughs> How would I know it's a misprint? Yeah. It's, no, I didn't. Tony Talk Harding. about a happy accident. That's like. Right? I know. And he's great. He's great. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, uh, okay, so. Um, I think we only have time for a few more things, but um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about the music in the film, because I feel like the music is so fantastic, right? Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the uh, process was like to get all these amazing songs, and was that always sort of like part of the, of the, uh, of the package, of the idea? Was this sort of soundtrack, or did that come later? This was... Um it wasn't in the script, but it, again, like I love Scorsese's films, obviously, and this juxtaposition of the music versus the scene you're seeing when you're seeing something very horrific and there's something upbeat against it. and Also, you know, some of David O. Russell's stuff. And I really felt like to make this a fun ride and make this palatable, it needed that energy and it needed music. So Nicholas and I, Karis uh, Karatanis, he's, he's Greek, he's a Greek name, but he's Belgium. <laughs> But he's not here, right? It's like, no. But um, <laughs> uh, we sat down, and when we were going through the script, we just looked for opportunities to, because you have to shoot a long, all these long shots and all these pieces to have room for the music. Um, right. So there was a lot of music that was designed, and I like to cut on the set, so we'd actually drop songs in, like the Romeo and Juliet song and Devil Woman and mm -hmm. Super Tramp. So we would cut those in as we were shooting and design these shots um, as we were going. So we ended up 
having, I think it was like 48 songs in the film, which the financiers weren't really thrilled about. <laughs> but we got them. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. It adds this whole other like sort of um, emotional element to the film that I think it, it uh, functions really well. Um, so uh, the, the other thing I, I have to ask about before we go is um, I think the titling of the film is so interesting to me, I, Tanya, because it sort of contextualizes the whole story as this sort of Shakespearean um, thing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was trying for. <laughs> no, do you want to know where it came from? Yes, please. Uh, it was uh, three things. It was me sort of having fun with this very famous book called I, Claudius. Of course. Uh, and it was also, I, Tanya, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, because a lot, a lot of the movie is about truth and the perception of truth. And then uh, it also, they're all being interviewed. And so they're all trying to put their good face on and control the narrative. And to me, the, the title, I, Tanya, sounded just a little fancy. <laughs> you know, like they're, like they're trying to like, you know, put their good face on. So it was those three things. Um, so how long have you been interested in this story of Tanya Harding? Not long. <laughs> really? No. I, I saw a documentary on 30 for 30, and that there were things in it that I thought were interesting, like the perception of truth and memory and uh -huh. family and class. And, and it, it's actually stuff that I write about in, uh, like a lot. So I'm clearly trying to work something out. <laughs> you know, I don't know what, but yeah. Um, that's fantastic, Mr. Gillespie. Have you seen that documentary? The um, I saw it after, you know, after the script came along, and and uh, it was really a good resource for us. There's so much footage on Tanya from that period as well. Right. There was a documentary which was 15 that we uh, looked at as well, which literally is the is the scene with uh, Lavana with the bird and the fur coat that's from that documentary, which we see at the very end. A, a, a fellow skater of hers shot it. Like another 15 year old <laughs> friend. Uh, so there's some amazing stuff that we ended up getting able to research, and and there's a lot of you know down to wardrobe and. I, the three of you are so like laid back about this. You make it seem so easy. <laughs> like you guys are kind of eh, we just made a movie, no big deal. The movie's amazing. I think it's absolutely my favorite movie of the year. I hope you guys um, have a lot of success with it. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Thank you all for sticking around. Thank you everybody.